I'm not your guy on that. No. It's good to see everyone here tonight. We're having Bible school this week, if you haven't figured that out. It is on heroes and villains, and it's been good. We've had good crowds tonight. We're talking about Saul and David, and I've really enjoyed studying this topic. Uh, David's one of my favorite characters in Scripture, and I have read this many, many, many times, but you go back and you do it all afresh, and it's amazing how many things you pick up you didn't get the first time or the fourth time or the tenth time through it. Uh, it just continually, uh, new things come to light. And the Bible's designed that way. Uh, it is designed to continue to challenge you. And when Paul told Timothy to study to show himself approved unto God, a workman needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of tr truth, uh, you won't get done studying Scripture. There won't be a point in your life where you can say, I know it all. Because it continually, if you study, have new things come to light. And that certainly has happened with me. The fact that David exists, we know, because the Bible tells us it, that he did. Uh, we don't have any doubts about what the Bible has to say because we know that the evidence is there uh, scripturally that the Bible is true. But the, David was not corroborated as an actual somebody until 1993. And so there are always skeptics that are ripping at the fabric of the Bible trying to prove that uh, the Bible is not true. And there was a big contention among skeptics that David was just a superhero that never really existed. And in 1993, there was an archaeologist, and I don't remember his name, and you wouldn't if I told you, so it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they were doing uh, archaeological work in the northern part of in Israel. And if I remember right, the area is called Tel Fin, and Tel stands for tower. Uh, the ziggurats, they're called in Babylon, they built towers or tells all over. But this particular archaeological dig uh, they dug up a 3,000-year-old black monolisk that had inscriptions on it, and it was the record of Benadad of Damascus, Syria, which the Bible records. And Benadad had conquered the Israelite people. This would have been in the period of time that the northern kingdom was lost. And uh, he says that uh, he had conquered the children of the house of David. And so there was archaeological proof David did exist within the time that uh, is relevant. So that's one of the things that I learned in doing this work. We're going to look at Saul and David tonight. We're going to look at their characters. We're going to look at the uh, things that made them be the way they are. And one of the things that you need to look at in any study is the setting, or what was going on at the time. And I have some questions that I'll ask you. I want you to participate. If you don't participate, we'll get done early. <laughs> so there's pressures on. Uh, what was the situation in Israel that led to people demanding a king? Do what? They wanted to be like the nations around them. Uh, what was going on in the social fabric of Israel at the time? Okay. They had judges. Samuel is considered a judge. Uh, were they a morally good people, or ha what was the situation there? If you go back to the latter part of Judges, one of the most awful stories in the Bible occurs at the end of Judges, there was a Levite that took a concubine and she left him and went back to her father in uh, Judah, Bethlehem, or Bethlehem, Judah. Let me get that part right. Uh, the Bible says she went a whoring. And so he 
goes back to get her, and she, he stays with that family for a few days, and he starts home with her, and uh, they have traveled, and they're getting near dark, and she says, let's go into this town and stay the night. He said, no, I'm going to go to where my people are. I want to stay with the uh, children of Israel. And so they go to Gibeah, and uh, they are on the street, literally. Nobody offers them anything. And as your story unfolds, you see why Gibeah was the way it was. But uh, they are not offered a room. They're not offered anything. But he said, we have straw to sleep on. We're fine. And an old man came along, and uh, he had come from work in the fields, and he offers them to come to the house. And so he goes to the house with him, and his concubine with him, and these uh, homosexuals come and beat on the door, and they want the Levite to come out. And the man of the house comes and says, you can't have him, I'll give you my daughter who is a virgin, and I'll give you the concubine. And they refuse that, and then wind up, they give him the concubine. And so they abuse her all night long, bring her back the next morning, and she's dead there on the step. And that whole thing is awful, and this Levite is awful. I don't care what he thought, but he cuts her into 12 pieces and sends her to the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, the, the other tribes become really incensed about this, and they come together, and the Levite tells them the story. And so they send word to, the, to Gibeah, which is one of the cities of the tribe of Benjamin, and say they want those men who did that crime. And Benjamin refuses to give them to them. The Bible refers to these men as sons of Belial. And so they're going to harbor them. They're going to take care of them. And so Israel goes to war against the tribe of Benjamin. And after the three days, because Israel loses a lot of men, God is given them the word to do, and he says on the third day, go, you'll take the battle today. And so they set up a ruse where they draw them out of town, and they destroy the tribe of Benjamin. If my math's right, there were about 900 men left after all this battle. They killed them all. They didn't even have wives, and they had made a pact that they weren't going to give them any women, and so how were they going to survive as a tribe? And so... We're not studying that tonight, but they find them wives from uh, neighboring peoples, and the tribe starts, but it is the smallest tribe in Israel. At the end of the book of Judges, it says, and there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Now, what does that tell you about them? Huh? Can you think of a time similar? <laughs> Today. Yeah, you, our laws don't mean anything anymore. Uh, if you are of the right persuasion, you can get by with anything right now. And uh, the parallels to some of these things and what we have to deal with today are really similar. And there are lessons to be learned of that. 1 Samuel 2.12, well, I'll save that. Let me save that for just now. The book of Judges ends with the near annihilation of the tribe of Benjamin in Gibeah. The book of 1 Samuel opens with Eli as priest, and Eli has two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who also served as priests. And of course, you remember at the beginning of Samuel, the main story is Hannah. Hannah was a wife of a man who had another wife who was having kids she couldn't have any. And uh, she was so wrought about the fact she couldn't have kids that uh, she goes to the uh, celebrations and she prays. And Eli hears her praying. And he comes to her and talks to her and tells her that she will have a child. She promises the child to God if she can just have a son. And so she has Samuel. And she raised Samuel to a certain point and then brought him to the uh, synagogue to serve. And that's where, how Samuel gets his start. 
1 Samuel 2, 22 through, well, I'm going to save that one too. Hang on just a minute. <laughs> Eli, from what I can read, tried to do the right thing, but he had some outlaw sons, and he didn't deal with them. Now I'll read this verse I've been trying to read. 1 Samuel 2, 22 through 25. Now Eli was very old, and her all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he said to them, Why do, you do, why do you such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. And so, uh, Hophni and Phinehas were evil. They would stand and wait on the people to bring their sacrifices, and they would take of the meat that they were bringing to their sacrifices and let, wouldn't let them do to that portion what they were supposed to do. Uh, they were scoundrels from the get-go. And not a whole lot is said about Eli, but Eli didn't do a great job as a father. We know that for a fact. Uh, we see in chapter 2 here that Eli got after his sons a little, but he should have taken them out of their position. And so uh, these are all issues that are going on in the background as we start to look at Saul and David. You look at Samuel... Samuel is considered a judge, and he served God well, and he was well respected in the country. Uh, everywhere he went, he brought respect and even fear in some people's minds because of his relationship with God and his word and what it meant. But he had two sons who were rascals as well. 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 5, And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel, now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, and came to Samuel and unto Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. And so it was correctly said they wanted a king like all the other nations. And their motivations weren't normal, but they did have leadership issues with some of the people they had to deal with, and that helped motivate them to want a king. But they had a God leading them. Samuel was telling them everything they needed to know, but that was never good enough for them. They were a challenge from the time they left Egypt all the way through, where most of them died in the wilderness, all the, on through till they go into captivity, into Assyrian captivity and a ca captivity in Babylon. They were a really hard-headed people. And uh, they wanted a king. And so in First Samuel, uh, question number two, what was Samuel and God's reaction to their demand for a king? How did Samuel feel about it when he was told that they wanted a king. He felt like the people had rejected him. He did. He took the rejection personally because they were questioning his ability to lead and to do the things he needed to do. But in uh, 1 Samuel 8, 6 through 8, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us, and Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected me, thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. And so God points out to Samuel, it's not you they're rejecting, they're rejecting me. And uh, the hard-headed nature of these people, Jared and I were talking last night, he said they're not too different from us today. And that's true, but it seems like they continued to do these things over and over and over again. Last night was on Moses. Moses has to have some of the most respect of any man in the Bible because he dealt with two million people for 40 years in the wilderness whining that whole time. And he stayed sane. 
But God was leading him and telling him what to do, and then Moses sends, and it cost him his trip into the promised land, all for this bunch of whiny people. <laughs> I think about that every time I think about Moses, because Moses truly was an amazing man, and we're going to see so is David. They were hard-headed people. They were a difficult people to deal with. And so God told Samuel to not take this personally, that they're rejecting him. Verse 8, according to all the works which they have done since the day I took them out to, brought them out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. And so they worshipped the idols. They were into idol worship and all the things that went along with idol worship. And uh, Samuel had a hard job. He was one man moving through the country. And as uh, judges pointed out, every man did what was right in his own eyes. So question number three, who was Saul and how was he selected to be king? That's right. He was a Benjamite, which is of the tribe that we spoke about that was nearly annihilated at the end of Judges. And uh, he is a member of that tribe. He was the son of Kish, 1 Samuel 9, 1 through 2. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Api, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward he was higher than any of the people. So Saul was the son of a powerful man. And the Bible says powerful, but I want to read into that a little bit that the man had wealth as well. There are things that happen in childhood in anybody's childhood that affect their character as they move on through life. And parents are responsible for the development of that character to a degree. Uh, your character continues to develop as you mature and as you grow old. And Saul had character issues, and we're going to look at some of those. And if you look at the type of family he was born into and you relate that to some of the things that you recognize today with wealth uh, and power, then you might kind of understand Saul a little bit better. We uh, saw a car tonight at the gas station. It was a BMW sports car, probably a $100,000 car. And Kim says, is a young guy driving? I said, no, he's got gray hair. <laughs> he said, he's the only one who can't afford it. <laughs> but but uh, uh, that kind of situation a lot of times you see, and you see people that are really spoiled, and they throw tantrums, and there are tantrums that Saul threw. I want to draw some conclusions that the Bible doesn't specifically say, but we'll, we'll see what you think. In 1 Samuel 9, 3 through 10, And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise, go seek the asses. And he passed through Mount Ephraim, and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they found him not. Then they passed through the land of Shalem, and there, were, there they were not. And he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they found them not. And when they were come to the land of Zoph, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come and let us return, lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. And he said unto him, Behold now, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that, saith, all that he saith surely comes to pass. Now let us go thither, for adventure he can show us our way that we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, Then said Saul to his servant, Behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. Before in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is called, now called the prophet was before time called the seer. Then said Saul to his servant, Well said, come let us go. So they went to the city where the man was. 
we're going to see here that God speaks to Samuel and tells him there'll be a man of the tribe of Benjamin come to you tomorrow, and this is the man that uh, you'll anoint for the new king. 1 Samuel 9, 15 through 16. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people of Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because their cry is coming to me. So one of the things that you see, and I'll talk about this in the next question in more detail, Saul has gone to look for the animals, and he's got his servant with him, but his servant is the one that kind of takes the lead here. He said, let's go find out. He said, no, let's go back to daddy. And uh, the, the servant talks him into going to the seer, and it was the servant had the money to pay for it. And I'm sure Samuel didn't charge for that, but just my thought there. Uh, in 1 Samuel 9, 27 through 10, 1, and as they were going down to the end of the city, and now let me fill in the gap here. They go to see Samuel. And they ask about it, and God has told Samuel that this guy is going to be the one. And so they eat together, they talk, and then as they go out of the city, that's where we are, 927 through 10.1, and as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us, and he passed on. But stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Then Samuel said in verse 6, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with him, them, and shalt be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs are coming to thee that thou do as the occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And so in 1 Samuel 10, 9, and it was so, but when he turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all these signs came to pass that day. The question was, who was Saul and how was he selected to be king? That's how the selection took place. The people were demanding the king. Uh, it says that Saul was a goodly person, that he stood head and shoulders above everybody else. Uh, I take the way it describes He's that much taller than everybody else. And he was good looking. And he had all the things that people would want in a king. And so they were going to meet the Israelites' demands from that standpoint. Uh, next question. How did young Saul differ from young David? This is when we get into the character thing that I was talking about. Just based on what you know about Saul, not having had time to go back and read all this, what are some things that you can look at about Saul's youth that would make you question whether he was able to be a king? Right. Right. Uh, bashful may be a description for what Saul was. Any other thoughts? You go back to what we just read with regard to the servant. He seems indecisive to me because he wants to go back. He wants to give up on the job. He, David would have been running to the job. But Saul kind of withdraws himself and his servant gets him back on track again. And so that's one thing you can point to. He doesn't seem to be a person with much self-esteem. Uh, he seems... Depending on the servant, when Saul expresses hope for Israel and him and his family, he says in 1 Samuel 10, 21 through 23, wait, wrong verse, 1 Samuel 9, 20 through 21, and as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, this is Samuel speaking to Saul, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on all thy father's house? And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, my family the least of all the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore thou speakest so to me. 
And so Saul couldn't believe that Samuel were saying these things to him, that the hope of Israel was on him. Uh, he was not that kind of person that reached out and seizes an opportunity, you might say. The way they select him for the people is by lot. And if you turn to uh, 1 Samuel 10, 21 through 23, the people are assembled and Samuel is there and they're going to draw lots to see who it is. Starting in verse 21, he says, When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. And when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore they acquired of the Lord further, if the man should yet come thither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. And they ran and fetched him thence, and when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. Once again, this is a uh, responsibility that didn't seem that Saul wanted to accept. And so uh, this is a king that fit the people's bill, but did he fit the bill of God? God knew what was going to take place. He knew what kind of king Saul was going to be. He knew exactly what Saul was going to do. But he was going to let the people have their way here, and then he would put a man in power that was after his own heart. This is heroes and villains we're speaking of here, and what's interesting about this, uh, Saul's not actually anointed king until he acts on a threat to the uh, tribe of Benjamin at Jabesh Gilead. And I think they brought a lot of their own stuff on them because they seem to be just really out there in left field. 1 Samuel 11, verses 1 through 6. Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. It sounds like a deal. And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days respite, that we may send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel. And then if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul, and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field. And Saul said, What aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. And so help is going to be organized for the people of Jabesh Gilead, and they're going to go take care of the Ammonites. Verses 11 through 15 of the same chapter, And it was so on the morrow that Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the host in the morning watch, and slew the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it came to pass that they which remained were scattered, so that two of them were not left together. And the people said unto Samuel, Who is he that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men, that we may put them to death. And Saul said, Thou shalt not a man be put to death this day, for today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. Then said Samuel to the people, Come and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. So Saul is anointed, and then Saul's lot is drawn before the people. But there were some sons of Belial there that didn't think he should be king. And so there was some controversy. And so here's Saul in this scene out in the field working when they come to him and tell him the story about the uh, men of Jabesh Gilead and the Ammonites. And so it says the spirit of the Lord kindled within him and his anger motivated him to organize companies and they went and slew the Ammonites. So that was Saul's first big victory. It was God that was driving him forward to these battles. And he was not a puppet. God didn't take him over and make him do anything other than motivate him because Saul was a free moral agent, and we're going to see that because Saul makes some stupid decisions in his life. 
Uh, but it was through God that these victories came. In 1 Samuel 13, 1 through 14, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul and Michmash, and in Mount Bethel, and a thousand were in, John, in were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet through all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had an abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which was on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward from beth Aven. Now when the men of Israel saw they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and thickets and rocks and high places and in pits. Saul's son, Jonathan, had the heart of a lion. And him and David were really close friends. A lot of Saul's success came through Jonathan. Jonathan smoked this garrison of the Philistines, which brought the Philistines out in great numbers. And they got the Israelites cornered. What would have been David's reaction in that scene? He had gone after him, attacking both directions. Uh, Saul stayed in the shade. We're going to see that here. Verse 7, And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. They ran. And as for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed, but Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. He was losing his troops, everybody was running, and so Saul, on his own good idea, or lack thereof, decided he better do something about this. And so he said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings, and he offered the burnt offering. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. Was he authorized to do that? He doesn't appear to be a godly man if you... Look at all the things that are said about him. <laughs> you didn't hear that. Um, here he is going to do something that's completely unauthorized. And so he offers the burnt offering, and it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee, for now would the Lord have established thy king upon Israel forever, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Saul, in the second year of his reign, failed. He didn't have faith in God. He didn't have faith in Samuel, and he acted to keep his people together from his own heart rather than depending on God to take care of him. Samuel came right after he gave the burnt offering. And so uh, that character issue, uh, he didn't have his priorities in the right place. He didn't have the faith he needed to uh, be in the position he was in, but it's what the people wanted. You look at... Uh, just making sure I didn't leave anything out. His disobedience cost him the kingdom. Of course, Samuel told him that. He reigns for 40 years. And so two years into a reign of 40, he's already got on the wrong side of God. And he winds up warring the whole 40 years that he is king. 
He fights the people all around him. You go over to chapter 15, and he is sent to utterly destroy the Amalekites. And so they organize, they go, and they fight the Amalekites, and they were told to utterly destroy, which means they were supposed to destroy everything. Men, women, children, animals, clean slate, wipe them all out. Well, what they do, rather, they come back with the best of the animals, and they save the king, and they bring him back. And that was the last straw for, Sam, for Saul. The uh, Bible says in chapter 15 that it repented God that he had made him king. And then the spirit of the Lord departs from Saul, and an evil spirit troubled him for the rest of his reign. And you see Saul in this process kind of go crazy. If you go through all the uh, things recorded about his efforts to kill David. Uh, several times David went in where he was at night and could have taken his life. And then we're going to talk about David's character in a minute, but he didn't do it. And he would see how close he was to death and how honorable David was, and he'd back off. But he was back on the same thing the next day. He literally went nuts because God's spirit was not with him. And uh, he made a lot of bad decisions, and his kingdom was a failure because of his lack of faith and his lack of obedience. David, on the other hand, had confidence. He had self-esteem. Where do you think that confidence and self-esteem came from? It came from God. God David was a godly man. And uh, I get fired up talking about this, reading these things about him, because it would be fun to follow him. <laughs> You, you see these superhero movies, and David was not supernatural. God's spirit was with him. But David did some incredible things, and everybody else was afraid. They were quaking in their boots. He was faithful to God, and God was with him. He's described as Jesse's younger son uh, in 1 Samuel 16, 11 through 12. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look on. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. How old do you think David was at this point? David, when he went against uh, Goliath was probably in his mid-30s. I'm going to prove that here in a minute. Uh, we all see him as a young boy because of Bible schools when we were little <laughs> and the uh, flannel boards and the uh, show of that little boy out there in the midst of all of it talking to Goliath. But uh, we're going to see proof that David was a man himself. In 1 Samuel 16, 15 through 16, And Saul's servant said unto him, that being Saul, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand and thou shalt be well. In 17 and 18 of the same chapter, And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in play, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. He's talking about David. David was a man of valor, a man of war. Does that sound like that teenage kid or little boy that we picture in our minds when we read this story? Uh, the uh, effort here to help Saul with the playing of a heart, David was skilled at that. And so David winds up going and playing the harp for David and becomes his uh, armor bearer. So getting in our mind, David, who he is when he goes up against Goliath, he's still vastly outnumbered, but he's very capable. Eddie? It doesn't say that, though. That's the Bible school. 
What it says is he refused to use it because he had not tested it. It would be like picking up a new style of rifle and shooting it to save your life. Uh, Dustin? Possibly, but it doesn't say that. It just says that he didn't want it because he had not proved it. He took Goliath's sword and cut Goliath's head off. We'll see that in a minute. Later on, he takes Goliath's sword when he has to run from the uh, uh, house. So it was not that he was not capable of using it, but it was a new weapon for him, and he was not going to go do that. He was going to do what he was accustomed to doing. So... Uh, if you look at what scriptures actually say, and I'm, I'm guilty of everything you said, I've had these same thoughts because those are the things on the flannel boards that come to my memory. Uh, but he, the scriptures do point out that uh, he was very capable. David had courage, and that courage came because he had trust in God. In 1 Samuel 17, 24 through 27, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, and they were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king, will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And so when David comes into the camp, and his brothers are giving him a hard time because he's come to the camp, and he's, he wants to know what's going on, so they tell him about Goliath. Goliath is a giant. Uh, it says that his spear was like a weaver's beam. Uh, any man... Saul, tall as he was, if he had had the guts to do it, would not have stood before him. But uh, David hears what happens to the man that will fight Goliath, and he asks the question again. He said, what would you say will happen if you take out Goliath? He asks it three times. And I heard a guy speak who was one of Reagan's speech writers, and he pointed this out in his speech. Because I didn't remember that from the Bible school stories either. <laughs> uh, David was not motivated by material things, but he asked three times what's going to happen. He gets the king's daughter, family gets to live free. And so, 1 Samuel 17, 32 through 37, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight the Philistine. 33, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight him, for thou art but a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion, and out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. So David was ready to go. He was confident that God would have his back. And you have to think in his attitude, you go back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to kneel before the image and wind up being thrown in the furnace of the fire. And it said, it may be that God save us, but if not, we're going to be faithful to God. And don't you believe David's attitude was very similar? Uh, we think about the things that affect us on a daily basis, and we look at some of the things that go on in this country, and we've had a good run here. As Christians, a lot of the things that we have prayed for are coming true. Abortion is beaten back. It's not defeated by any means, but the law that protected it is down. And the fight's really only the beginning. But God is answering our prayer. And so we have to have the courage that David had to stand through these things and fight them on through because the uh, bad people are 
coming after us. It reminds me of the people outside the door at Lot's home in Sodom. Howard? Oh, I thought you did that. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. David had the heart of a leader, but that heart came from his faith in God. And his confidence came from his faith in God. And uh, we have to take that same confidence. You know, we're, we're, we're eternal beings. We're going to live forever. It's just where are we going to spend that eternity? And uh, we have got to stand where we're supposed to stand and do the things we need to do to push the envelope forward and win these battles. We can't shrink from it. What you saw with Saul is shrinking. Uh, his people started to leave him, and he lost his confidence, his faith. He sacrifices himself. He was not authorized to do so. You see the entire opposite thing from David. And his belief and faith in God is key to that. In 1 Samuel 17, 38 through 51, and Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And you see that picture of the big, big helmet on David and the stuff, and he's kind of over like that. He can't hold it up. None of that's said in Scripture. But David refused to use the stuff because he was not used to it. And it may have been too big because Saul was a big man. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. countenance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh into the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. This had the whole army of Israel quaking in their boots. Saul was in the background, scared of him. And the Philistine said, then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I'll give the, carc give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air, into the wild beasts of the earth, and that all earth may know that there is a God of Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. You think about that. Here's a man standing there, maybe four feet taller than you are, big as a barn, armed to the hilt, and you're right back in his face. I'm going to cut your head off. The battle is the Lord's. And it came to pass, when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Here's David going to meet him, and he's running He's ready to go. This is the stuff that gets you fired up reading it. And it came to pass, just read that, and David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell into his face upon the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. So David, with God's power, beats the giant. And then the Israeli armies go after him to, uh, and chase the Philistines. David, and as was pointed out, the big lesson to take from this is we need to have courage that God is...
our back, and we need to take those hard stands, and we need to speak up, and we need to let people know where we stand and what we're going to do. And uh, these are difficult stands to take at times, but we have to have the courage to do it. Worst thing can happen to us is we get killed, and we just go to heaven or go to paradise, heaven eventually. We live on. And so these are important things to think about when we think about our welfare. There are worse things than dying. And uh, we see two men here who made right and wrong decisions, and one suffered because of it, and one became a great king because of it. Something else you see here is the imperfection of both of them. We go on, we don't have, you could spend a month talking about David. No way you can do it in class. The hardest thing about this class was what to talk about about David because you've got to whittle it down a little bit. David, had he was not a perfect man. He made mistakes. And uh, you read all the things about him. The one big thing we see that he did, and I'm sure he made many mistakes, but the one big sin that he did was with, of course, Bathsheba and then having Uriah murdered, in essence, because... They withdrew the army from him. Uh, and then Nathan comes to him, the prophet, and tells him the story about the man with the one lamb and the rich man taking his lamb instead of one of his own. And David is angered, and he said, you're the man. You did this. What was David's response? He was touched. He admitted he had sinned. He repented of that. And then he loses the child from that uh, escapade. And the Bible points to the fact that he fasted, he prayed, he sat in ashes, he wouldn't eat. Well, that's what fasting is, obviously. But uh, his people are trying to get him to eat. And then when the child dies, he gets up, cleans himself up, and go eat. And he said, his people said, what's the deal? You wouldn't eat the whole time. And now that he's dead, you're all cleaned up and life's going on. And he said, as long as he was alive, and these are not his exact words, but in essence, as long as he was alive, there was a chance that God might save him. But God's taken him, and so have to go on. David's house was plagued with death and problems from then on. But what you see in David, even to the end of his life, is he stayed faithful. And when he gives the charge to Solomon, he tells Solomon to stay true to God. And he said, if you'll stay true to God, everything will go well. One of the things I meant to mention, I had all this stuff in my head that I wanted to say at the beginning, when the people wanted a king, God told Samuel to tell them what a king's going to be like. And so Samuel goes to him and he said, your sons will have to go serve in the uh, army. He'll have them working. He'll have them doing things. You won't have them. Your daughters will have to go work as bakers. Your riches will have to go to the king and you'll be in servitude to the king. And they wanted a king anyway. What reminded of that is what I was going to say next. When Solomon became king, Solomon doubled down on them as far as their work goes, and uh, they were crying out because the king was so heavy on them. And then when Sam Solomon dies, uh, the king that comes to place Solomon's son doesn't listen to the wise old men and says, take your foot off their neck a little bit and let them breathe. The young guys say, double down, double down. And so that was Rehoboam. He doubled down, and he winds up losing the people. The northern kingdom splits off and goes with Jeroboam. And all the things that Samuel said in that chapter when he was telling, that was back in the uh, beginning of Samuel, all the things he said came true. And the kingdom split over it. But you look at uh, David, and you look at, Saul, there were a huge difference in the two men. The selection of David, the next question I had, how did the selection of David as king differ from the selection of Saul? David was a man after God's own heart. And God chose the man he wanted based on David's heart. He told Samuel, don't look on the countenance of him. Don't look at how he looks. He says, I can see his heart. And he's the one I want. And David was that man. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
course, the last question I had here, we're out of time. How did the rains differ? Do you think Saul had a successful reign? No, when God withdrew his spirit from Saul, Saul was on the way down, and he reigned for 40 years. Uh, you read about the uh, statements that are made in Samuel about Saul, and it's a relatively brief part of Samuel that covers Saul. You see Saul chasing David. That's the most of what you see. But he did war with all the people around him, and certainly his kingship was not a successful one. David's was. Jared? Right, right, and that's true. Uh, David is mentioned prominently in the New Testament to that regard. Uh, you look back at how David may have been brought up. Mothers are really important in the life of a son. Nothing is said about David's mother. Uh, last night we talked about Moses, or Joy mentioned Moses' mother was allowed to raise him to a certain age and when Moses got to be near 40 years old he remembered the things his mother had taught him and uh, uh, we don't know anything about Jesse really he had eight sons that's about all we know about him but something made David who he was and his faith in God was part of it his upbringing was part of that as well and a lesson we can take as parents is just that is that we need to do everything we can to get our kids brought up in the right way, and part of that is getting God first in their lives and teaching them the right things and seeing you put the right emphasis in that. Obviously, that happened in David's life because David was who he was. Their reigns differed due to the success, and that success was due to the Spirit of God being with him. Saul went backwards when God withdrew his spirit. The things that made Saul able to win those thousands, as the people said, uh, were because God was with him at one point. But then here comes David. Saul killed his thousands. David is ten thousands or something to that effect. I don't have that verse in here. Uh, David was a warrior. David at one point wanted to build the temple. And God didn't let him do it because he said he had blood on his hands. He said, but your son will do it. And so David made preparation for those things when Solomon came into the kingdom. As king, he built the temple. There's a lot of good lessons you can take from this. And like I said, the hardest thing about doing this lesson was picking out a few things to talk about because there's so many and I, I read and read and reread this, and I thought, I've got to whittle this down. <laughs> and so this is kind of where I landed. Uh, hopefully you have enjoyed it and uh, continue to study. We're done. Thank you. Thank you. Now, David could not have been in his 30s when he took the giant off. He had to be in his 20s or teens. Here's why. You shouldn't be up here critiquing the man just when he gets done. Come on, cut him some slack.